Namaste and greetings. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher and assistant editor at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anisandhan Sansthan, Nai Dili, welcome you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a book discussion of Educational Strategies for Youth Empowerment in Conflict Zones by Professor Naila Ali Khan. This deliberation is being organized by the IMPRI Center for Human Dignity and Development. I feel privileged to introduce the author and speaker, Professor Naila Ali Khan. Ma'am is the professor at Oklahoma City Community College, University of Oklahoma, USA. Author of several published articles, book reviews, and editorials, she has edited Parchment of Kashmir, a collection of essays on Jammu and Kashmir, written four books, including The Fiction of Nationality in an Era of Transnationalism and Islam, Women and Violence in Kashmir, Between India, India and Pakistan. Several of her articles have appeared in academic journals, newspapers, and magazines in the United States and South Asia. Dr. Khan has presented lectures on the subject of Kashmir at several universities, including American University, Columbia University, and New York University. She is an Oklahoma humanities scholar presenting public talks statewide, including women's correctional facilities, where she focuses on education and women's empowerment. Dr. Khan was recognized at the OK State Capitol for her human rights work in 2018 and honored by the Oklahoma League of Women Voters as one of the 100 trailblazers for 2018. She was recently awarded the President's Volunteer Service Award and Silver Medal for her national public speaking and her bridge building work at the community and grassroots level in the state of Oklahoma. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much, Mahima. Thank you for that very kind introduction. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, I would like to begin my talk on a personal note and to talk about the personal relevance of my book, Educational Strategies for Youth Empowerment in Conflict Zones. Um, Professor Khan, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Uh, yes. If you would allow, we could have uh, we could have the introductions of our discussants, and then we can Absolutely. invite you. If that Absolutely. Is Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. Ma Thank Go you. Go right ahead. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank Mahima. you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. We are fortunate to have Dr. Lida Vadia, Mr. Patrick B. McVivin, and Dr. Southern Hanjabam as the discussant for the session. Dr. Lila is the senior fellow, Observer Research Foundation, Mumbai. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Patrick is the reporter, writer, and analyst, the Oklahoma City Sentinel. We welcome you, sir. Very glad to be here. Thank you for Thank asking you. me. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sadam is the founder of YAOL, the youth network Manipur. Welcome, sir. Hi. Thank you for making me part of the session. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Professor Naila to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And uh, I'm delighted that we have such a wonderful panel of discussants, including my dear friend, Patrick McGuigan. So um, I will, as I said, I would like to begin on the personal importance of this book. While working on this book, I suffered a profound personal loss. My father, Muhammad Ali Matu, passed away on March 29th, 2020, after having battled lung cancer with emotional and spiritual strength and having chosen medical treatment altern alternatives with intelligence. While personal bereavement cannot be analogized with the trauma of a beleaguered community, I learned the importance of choosing one's attitude from my father. As Viktor Frankl 
writes in Man's Search for Meaning, quote, everything can be taken from man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's, one's own way, end quote. My father was not one to shy away from the inevitability of death. He understood his illness and knew that he had no control over the progression of the disease, but he retained control over his attitude. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that is the one thing we can exercise control over our attitude in times of difficulty. For the longest time, I did not come to terms with my father's illness. I couldn't bring myself to either talk about it or write about it. I convinced myself that his illness was curable. I couldn't bring myself to say the word cancer. When his disease was in remission, I deluded myself into believing that he was cancer free. But being the realist he was, my father reminded me that recurrence was a possibility and I needed to be prepared for that eventuality. He took his disease by the horns and did not sink into despair. Unlike a lot of people with cancer, he did not allow depression to overcome him and remained in complete control of his thoughts. No one could relieve him of his suffering or suffer in his place. He recognized that his unique opportunity lay in the attitude with which he bore his cross. He confronted this disease with the same composure with which he handled ordinary occurrences. He often told me that people should feel free to delight in life until the last breath. He taught me how to live and the flame of my father's love will never be extinguished. Every calamity and every conflict reminds us of the fragility of life. Life is transient and precarious. The sooner we realize that we live on the edge of an abyss, the more present we will be for every moment, big and small. Acknowledging the uncertainty of life will enable us to recognize the potential for meaning in every moment. Our lives have meaning not despite the fragility of life, but because of it. We can learn to see every challenge as an opportunity to grow because we are not immortal and must make the most of every minute on earth. A lot of us focus on big achievements and abstract concepts, forgetting that the small moments and small steps count as much as, if not more, than the big ones. Okay, let me move on. Father taught me that the essence of a home is the safe haven to all, it provides to all who reside in it. He enriched my life and taught me so much about keeping one's head above water, even in the most grueling situations. I see his life as a model to be emulated. My father's death is not devoid of meaning. Discovering meaning, as Viktor Frankl emphasized, creatively, experientially, and attitudinally enables us to pave pathways to
to meaning. Although I am older now, have traveled a lot more, and Kashmir has been mangled by several forces, it is still evocative of heaven for me. Even today, the only entity that has the power to make my heart melt is Kashmir. I, like my father, am in its thrall. And I too believe that the story of the people of Jammu and Kashmir is one of resilience, not of defeat. I hope the people of the region are given the opportunities to tell their own stories instead of being made to internalize stories that are imposed on them. I hope we see acknowledgement and recognition of their stories. I hope the marginalized and disenfranchised segment of the population is not merely interred into the catacombs of history. I hope its young people are given opportunities to engage with history from a perspective that empowers them. I hope that young people particularly the young people of Jammu and Kashmir are imbued with self-esteem because their story, God willing, will be one of restoration, not debasement. Writing a book is a journey on which I am accompanied by kindred souls. The power of the people who accompany me on that journey teaches me that relationships are the most valuable form of capital. I owe my commitment to restorative work in and outside the classroom to some incredibly dedicated and insightful people in the Oklahoma community who have not given up on building bridges and addressing the atrocities of injustice, even in politically threatening environments. My students remain my greatest source of strength. I have several students who are trying to make ends meet in a world transformed by COVID-19. Some of them are working two jobs so they can pay their bills. Others are working hard to support those of their family members who have been laid off or furloughed. There are some who don't have Wi-Fi access or erratic internet connections and cannot participate in Zoom, um, cannot participate in Zoom meetings as efficiently as they would like to. I see determination and perseverance in such young people. They push themselves to meet deadlines and step up to the plate. They have learned to see their challenges as opportunities to grow. And as an academic, I am here for them. While the transition to online classes came with its own set of challenges, my students did not throw in the towel. On the contrary, they adjusted to their new reality with a newfound confidence. My students and I were able to create a safe environment in which we examined our locations of privilege and sought emotional empowerment in order to understand systems that have generated a culture of silence about systemic discrimination. As we learn to understand more and more about trauma and resilience, we grow by working through the challenges and give one another the gift of seeing strength in one another's narratives. It is my sincere belief that understanding is only possible through the right kind of education. It is this belief that has motivated me to develop and present educational strategies for the transformation, not transmission, of trauma in conflict zones. Young people, as I have reiterated several times, need to be reminded 
that despite the several letdowns, the process of democratization is an evolutionary one and does not provide instant solutions. In our zeal to be flag bearers of revolutionary movements, I would argue, we forget the importance of facilitating the healing of trauma survivors. We forget to help them anchor and stabilize their individual and collective identities while repairing biographical wounds. Communities cannot be revived and nations cannot be rebuilt unless we actively work to rehabilitate those who have witnessed or encountered acts of barbarity or savagery. We build trust within and between communities, engage and encourage young adults to acknowledge and celebrate heterogeneity, enrich learning environments where young people embrace authenticity and forge social cohesion, and train them to participate in decision-making processes. <clears throat> it also becomes necessary to encourage discussion on the role of individual responsibility, increase awareness that the enjoyment of rights works in tandem with the shouldering of responsibilities and enhance the emotional ability of young people to contribute to the repair of their communities, nations, and themselves. While not allowing ourselves to be overwhelmed by the overload of information that threatens to engulf lives, we would do well to remind ourselves that local communities exercise prodigious influence in the restoration of humanity. To that end, this book, in taking multidisciplinary approaches to major human rights issues, is a dynamic interplay between activists, academics, and clinicians. I have chosen to stay true to their ideas and words by reproducing them verbatim. I recognize the imperative of engaging with people in local communities, building on the resilience displayed by those communities in the wake of humanitarian disasters and incorporating communitarian coping strategies into educational methodologies that seek to empower such communities. Um, I have had the privilege of connecting and engaging with social justice activists, academics, and clinicians in the United States, South Africa, Canada, the Balkans, and Jammu and Kashmir, who in their work with diverse communities have interrogated hegemonic definitions of trauma and healing and have developed nuanced concepts of local coping strategies to effectively heal trauma. They efficaciously train citizens to seek creation of non-militarized, non-militant, and humane environments to ensure the rights of citizens to peacefully protest and be heard by their political representatives. The purpose of encouraging honest and uninhibited discussions in the classroom is to work through experiences that have prevented students from reaching their full potential. I have come across young people in the United States and South Asia who have had to deal with more than their fair share of loss, bereavement, and trauma. Spaces in which they could express themselves without fear of reprisal 
have shrunk. They are distraught and have a diminished sense of self that undermines their pride. They mourn the loss of values that they thought would buoy them up for eternity. They are disheartened by the looming sense that every political decision about their future will be presented to them as a fate accompli. The deterioration caused by political, economic, and social crises is greater than we might want to admit. Unless deliberate and well thought out attempts are made to rectify this damage by enabling the healing of trauma survivors in tandem with the struggle of political rights, the buzzwords of freedom, self-determination and revolution will not restore the well-being of a society. I would recommend a trauma-informed approach to justice in order to revive restorative justice, which would build in supports and seek to repair the harm rather than just punish the wrongdoer. In this era of political and moral discourse, people often turn a blind eye to the importance of community and institution building, particularly in regions upon which havoc has been wreaked by violent conflict. As I've said elsewhere, sloganeering, rabble rousing, demanding the incorporation of articles and constitutions and other theoretical issues are all very well. But the real test is whether these theories have a real impact on civil society instead of being just hollow words. So disparaging the importance of repairing the socio-cultural fabric of traumatized communities would be highly irresponsible. Michael Lapsley of the Institute for Healing of Memories in South Africa reminded me that conflict is not unique to Jammu and Kashmir, which is why it is important to find the particularities and commonalities with other conflicts and survivors of traumas caused by those discordant situations. Those who have been in the political arena for a long time must recognize that there is no politics without negotiation and the ultimate negotiating authority is always the citizens. Real democracies thrive on differences of opinion, not on gagging those who might not be on the same page. As I've said previously, the relationship of the only up until now Muslim majority state within India was contingent on the depths of Indian democracy. We, the people of Jammu and Kashmir, will not falter from our ideal, even if we are left alone in this great battle for democracy and humanity. Okay, so I would like to talk about an experiment in conflict transformation. Um, education, as we all know, stretches the mind with new ideas because educated people cannot be enslaved or led like cattle. Education makes it possible to question structural inequities and to demand remedy. Our young people, and this is probably a question for Saddam, who I think is the youngest on this panel, our young people in several parts of the world, particularly in conflict zones, lackadaisical, because they are convinced that regardless of their relentless efforts to make the world a better place, the status quo will remain unchanged. 
while mobilizing cultural and political coalitions is riddled with conflict, I would argue that it is the need of the day for us to engage in such processes. Such an experiment in international conflict transformation is already underway, according to Paula Green, who in 1997 founded a program for graduate students and others from zones of conflict around the world. She tells us that conflict transformation across cultures, known by its acronym CONTACT, provides an intensive residential educational experience for, for approximately 60 participants each summer for three weeks at the School for International Training in Vermont, where Professor Green is currently Professor Emerita. The program was augmented by a similar two-week program in Kathmandu, Nepal, specifically for South Asian participants who often cannot obtain visas for the US. In these programs, the learning is 24 seven day and night, as participants not only engage in class activities all day, but live together and spend time in building relationships that would otherwise never exist. Many participants meet the identified other of their nation's conflict at contact, which allows, for example, Indians and Pakistanis, Israelis and Palestinians, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, a rainbow of racial colors, and others divided by history and geography to humanize those they have been taught to hate and fear. The transformation that arises from this carefully designed laboratory creates a, a kind of freedom where the silence of their suffering is broken. Their empathy increases by leaps and bounds and palpable expressions of love pervade this newly built global community. Participants share heart-rending memories of war and demonstrate to each other by their very presence, the capacity for resilience, caring, and compassion. They explore the demands for justice, the need for truth and reconciliation, and the centrality of social inclusion, which they are practicing as they speak. Having drawn inspiration and strength from one another, they return to their war-weary countries as advocates of grounded experiential pedagogy and as skilled ambassadors of peaceful resolutions to conflict, of equality and respect, and of the need to use their traumas in the service of transformation and human well being. Professor Green believes that in our precarious era, our collective survival depends upon a significant portion of the human race accomplishing a change of worldview from one of patriotic and tribal loyalties to loyalty to life itself. Okay. Um, now, another example that I would like to give you is of the Balkan Republics. So I spoke with a practitioner, an American medical doctor who has been living in Croatia for the past three decades. And I spoke with him about his work in conflict transformation in the Balkans. So recalling his work with traumatized communities in Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia, Dr. Charles Tauber remarks that it is important that the negative aspects of the trauma not be forgotten, which is what happens often when some authors speak of resilience or positive psychology. He worked with Bosnians, Serbs, and Croats 
in a fragmented community on the Croatian-Bosnian border in 1999 to 2000. The three ethnic groups which that, which that community comprised had by then become protective of their exclusionary identities. No one had been spared the damage wreaked by the horrendous violence that was unleashed in the territory to which both the Bosniak Croat and Serb parties laid claim. After having worked with the multi-ethnic community in a zone of contention for a couple of years, Charles Taubert tells me each side asked him to facilitate arbitration between the contentious ethnic groups in order to build symbolic bridges across the checkpoints and observation points that had been installed to entrench lines of separation. Dr. Tauber candidly admits that the only reason he was able to facilitate dialogue between the three groups, which were separated by forces of rancor and vengeance, was because he was a third party arbitrator. He does not by any means claim that his arbitration between the Bosniak, Croat, and Serb communities at that focal point of tension helped every ethnic group keep its head above water and become more inclusive. He doesn't make that claim. The machinations of electoral politics did not end either, but talking to one another enabled the three groups to achieve a breakthrough, giving them a vantage point from which they could envision constructive reforms and multicultural identity. A well-informed conclusion that I have come to is that educators can play an indispensable role in creating opportunities for meaningful communication. Now, the importance of skills necessary for graduating from simply highlighting problems and holding rigid positions to solving problems for which flexibility and accommodating multiple points of view are necessary was brought home to me while teaching my students at the University of Oklahoma and at Oklahoma City Community College. As an educator, an Oklahoma humanities scholar, and a member of the Oklahoma Governor's International Team, I was keen on exploring methodologies that would increase the exposure of students in Oklahoma to global, political, economic, sociocultural, and gender issues. And that's the reason I jumped at the opportunity to teach at Oklahoma City Community College for a couple of years, because that gave me a chance to work with a constituency to which I had hitherto been unexposed. Several of my students come from challenging backgrounds. They had either experienced traumatic events or witnessed abuse or been victims of abuse. Some of them had substance related disorders which were complicated by comorbidities. One of the significant constituencies in my classes was that of veterans students who had been deployed to war zones like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and had suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder because of having witnessed deliberate acts of violence. Learning about the logical method of argumentation and employing it in their writings enabled the students to recognize that sound arguments were not about grandstanding, one-upmanship, or disseminating simplistic propaganda. On the contrary, making logical arguments in order to resolve problems makes it necessary 
to listen to opposing points of view, acknowledge their validity, and then build common ground to accommodate multiple points of view. Students learned the difficult lesson that resolving a problem entailed negotiating with opposing sides to avoid alienating them, which could be successfully accomplished only by respectful discourse. Every semester, I would encourage my students to take positions on relevant issues. Those experiences give students a new attitude to political discussion. They learn to respect the opposing side and to be curious about the arguments on both sides. Rather than seeing the discussion as simply a way of making boasts and assertions. It also gave students an opportunity to step outside their comfort zones and perceive the global impact of some of those issues. I recall a couple of my students who were military veterans arguing against militarization, although they were invested in it. Making logical arguments which were persuasive and propounded viable solutions enable students to cultivate the ability to place themselves in the shoes of the other person and to perceive the world through a lens different from their own. A rich imagination enables one to achieve a kind of insight into the experience of another group or person that is very difficult to attain in daily life, particularly in a world that is pervaded by a lack of understanding of each other and a paranoia that may lead to violence. I saw my students mellow down, become less aggressive, more conciliatory, and willing to negotiate once they learn to recognize shades of gray, which had been suppressed by monolithic narratives that portrayed the world in terms of black and white. <clears throat> I witnessed the students evolve as problem solvers who recognized that building bridges in an increasingly polarized world necessitated respectful discussions. Okay, I would like to give you one more example and then I'll stop, I have a lot more. So one more um, person I interacted with was Father Michael Lapsley of the Institute for the Healing of Memories. The Institute of the Healing of Memories was founded in South Africa in 1998. And their work is to break the cycle of dehumanization by which victims frequently become victimizers. The, the mission of the Institute for the Healing of Memories is to remember past injustices, ancient, old, and recent, and to heal our multiple woundedness, to redeem the past through empowerment and rehabilitation, and to heal by celebrating that which is life-giving and laying to rest that which is destructive. Now, I first met Father Michael Lapsley at the Fairview Missionary Baptist Church in Oklahoma City on October 21st, uh, 2019. Father Lapsley gave an inspirational and motivating talk on forgiveness and healing that evening, which several friends of mine and I attended. I was intrigued by the stories that my friends had told me about the poignant and, and impactful journey of Father Lapsley. He spent a great part of his life combating apartheid in South Africa and the machinery of death of the apartheid state. In 1990, three months after uh, Nelson Mandela was released from prison, an extremist group sent a letter bomb 
carefully placed within the pages of a religious magazine to Father Lapsley in Zimbabwe. Although he survived the bombing, he lost both hands and an eye. As a result of the horrific and ghastly blast, one cannot even begin to imagine how traumatic it must have been for him to lose both hands and an eye. But Lapsley's story is one of resilience, not of defeat. His unmitigated commitment to the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa and his tireless crusade against the forces of enmity and bigotry made a restorative impact on me and motivated me to get out of the funk I was in that evening. He had effectively transformed his trauma, recovered his agential capacities, and gone on to lead a fulfilling life, not as an invalid, but as a whole person, to work toward building a new society on the edifice of transformative justice. That evening, I was particularly distraught. This was 2019, remember. I was particularly distraught because of the grim situation in Kashmir. The autonomous status of Kashmir had been revoked two months before I met Lapsley, and eight million people continued to remain cut off from the world, including some members of my family. At the time, internet connectivity hadn't been restored in the Kashmir Valley, and it was hard to come by authentic information about the gravity of the situation there. I was becoming increasingly cynical and was emotionally fatigued because of the political paralysis in that region. During the question and answer session, I admitted to having a sense of defeat given the dreadful lack of civil rights in Kashmir. I asked Father Lapsley how one could entertain the thought of forging dialogue across enemy lines in oppressive environments. He replied that when Nelson Mandela was released from prison, he chose to disavow bitterness, rage, and the desire for revenge because Mandela was cognizant that if he remained embittered and declared war on the apartheid regime, thousands of his supporters would be massacred. Instead, he opted to engage in dialogue with those who had incarcerated him for 27 years. Lapsley expressed his solidarity with the people of Kashmir and reminded me to retain my sense of agency by showing, by acknowledging the stories of my people. In an email exchange that he and I had a few months later, Father Lapsley emphasized that while a key part of identity is knowing where we come from and the riches of our past, the problem is when the stories that are told from the past are filled with poisonous feelings like hatred and bitterness, which then distort the perceptions of the younger generation and keep conflict going for hundreds of years. But good memories which erase hostility and hate get ruthlessly trampled upon by both victims and victimizers in conflict zones. In response to my question about the importance of keeping good memories of a bygone era alive in a war-torn zone, Lapsley responded that his notion of the healing of memories is about the journey of acknowledging and beginning to let go of those things in the past that would destroy us and retrieving from the past that 
which is life-giving. That is the good memories. Um, I would like to, okay. So as I've said on several platforms, real leaders do not want their people to wallow in grief for eternity. Nor do real leaders build their castles on the agonies of those who have suffered tremendous losses. I would echo Father Lapsley by reiterating that national identity cannot be built on unquenchable hate for opposing forces, and certainly not on cashing in on the pain and grief of one's own people. In seeking larger political goals, like the right of self-determination, we ignore the mental and emotional health of the people for whom the goal is being sought. I would argue that even if colonialism and neo-colonialism come to an end, those who bear the scars of the cruelties of those phenomena will not be able to lead free, fulfilling, and whole lives unless we learn about trauma at a cerebral level. It is then that it can have the potential of leading to introspection, which could bring about change. We might not always be aware of the degree of woundedness that we have inherited, but once there is awakening and we come out of denial to take cognizance of how damaged we are, that creates the possibility of healing. That is the reason that it is important to create safe spaces where the silence can be broken in healthy ways. Within communities, there is always a space for initiatives, particularly from those who are considered credible and have standing. I have been cognizant of the healing power of telling one's own story, as well as the world of difference it can make in the life of a person whose story is acknowledged. So I have a lot more to say, but I will stop here and I will turn it over to the discussants. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for the very passionate and enlightening talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Saddam for his insights on the book and the discussion. Sir? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah. So thank you, ma'am, for the, for, for the uh, you know, insights on, on your book and congratulations for the book. So uh, for me, I Thank would also like that. to, yeah, for me, I would also like to, uh, you know, uh, brief a bit about my place that I'm from. Um, I'm from Manipur in India, like uh, Manipur is a border state with the, with Myanmar, which shares around uh, a long border with, with another international, uh, you know, country besides the other side of Pakistan and China. So uh, our region, the northeastern states, the eight northeastern states of India, has been under conflict from long, like much before we were born. I'm just 32 now, and much before there has been a lot of trauma and a lot of intergenerational trauma that has been, you know, um, passed down by our grandparents and parents. And uh, to start with, I would just like to tell you about an incident which happened day before yesterday in one of our neighboring states where. 14 civilians were killed by the armed forces day before yesterday on suspicion. They thought those people who were coming back from uh, coal mines, those 14, 15 people who were coming back from work for weekend holidays, they were shot dead just, on, just only on such suspicion that they were militants. So that is Armed Forces Special Powers Act that the special forces have in northeastern part of the country and in Jammu and Kashmir. So we felt that it was, it was no longer prevalent, but day before yesterday when Nagaland is having its 
state's biggest festival, the Hornbill Festival, it happened during that time. And to, till today, like everyone is so, you know, uh, traumatized, not only in Nagaland, but so many tribes, so many, all the states are so traumatized with this incident that it brought back so many other memories, which used to happen earlier in, even in Manipur also, more than 10, 20 people were killed just on suspicion or they would say mistaken identity. So it happened recently and it's not a new, like, uh, you don't know when will it stop. So uh, when uh, um, you were talking about uh, uh, the safe spaces, the, the, the one question that I or, and many of my friends usually uh, get asked by many of my friends from the mainland part of the country is that, is it safe to travel to Northeast? Is it safe to travel to Manipur? You know, this is one question that they would generally ask. And we are like, you know, we live there. We were born, we are born there and we live there. And, you know, and the day before yesterday's incident, again, made us realize that you were the one who did this thing. And now you are also asking, is it safe to travel there? These are not our own people that who are having this um, you know, the ambush was not done by our own, our own people. Ambush was done by people who were outside the Northeast, by the military forces. And people have been demanding that Armed Forces Special Powers Act be revoked, be removed, be repealed. But there has not been any much of, uh, you know, uh, work or any much of attention given to it. So at times we feel that animals have more protection than humans in conflict zones like Northeast and in Jammu and Kashmir. So we are, as we as young people are again made to question of what we really are. And when we, when we were talking about when in, in, in the national platforms that we talk about, when I talk about my work on health and well-being, and then conflict, one thing that always comes up is about caste, it's about caste religion is about class but i don't know why don't why people refrain to talk from in, in from the angle of race when people from northeast have a very different race and we uh, we face a lot of related to racial discrimination like we being a mongoloid origin we also feel a lot of um, suppression and oppression in terms of race like when we um, migrate outside our region for studies when, or when we migrate outside for our, the biggest thing that we face is racial discrimination. We are called Chinki, Chinese, Nepali and so many things, but not Indians. They will call all foreign names, but we are not Indians. So that is a kind of um, behavior that we generally face. And above that, as a, as a queer person myself, the, there is a huge another challenge of being But also, based on my gender, again, I'm again discriminated there. And I, um, as a person who have been, um, who have been beaten up by the uh, military people in my own state for loitering around in late night, no other reasons, I was put in uh, the cell for a night, beaten up badly. You know how trauma feels like. I live with post-traumatic PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But how we say that uh, trauma is transmitted. It transmits, it transmitted down from my parents of how we have been told to not go out from home, you know, after 6 p.m. or don't go out from home, it gets dark. So we have been raised like that. So we, whenever we go out, when it gets dark, it's, it's like, let's go back home. And it's, when I was in Bombay for my studies, the, the, this thing I always say that the, that the 12, 24 hours in Bombay and the 24 hours in Manipur or in any conflict regions are because we are losing that 12 hours out of the 20 at our homes, fearing what might happen to us, who might come and what might be done. Like what happened to those 14 people while they were coming back home, they were shot at. So we constantly live in a trauma of how to come how to come out of this thing and and um, 
one thing that we we have been facing we have been hearing a lot many times about diversity and inclusion but most of the time they forget about justice and of how we have been left out so much further and how justice has not been provided to young people like us so there are only two ways that when we talk about education there are or jobs or any other facility there are only two ways where how get access one is through migration that is the only that since we do not have those proper facilities here since we do not have that structure here the one thing that we do is to migrate outside our own states our, our own region to find a safe space outside but when we don't get it there that further excludes us from getting access to our basic rights of dignity or least dignity you know we are we are being shamed we are being called names and so many things so uh, one thing which ma'am have also uh, i what i really resonated was most of the people you know uh, when 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 you talk about military veterans who were your students who only saw those stories or who only saw, uh, issues from only one side i totally could imagine that because when we tell our stories to our friends they cannot really imagine of what we are going through they can only uh, simp not even empathize they can sympathize saying that so oh th that happens or like you know they will start comparing it with something that you know the protest police brutality in their own state police brutality on their own areas but how we have been you know migrating how we have been getting out of our homes to at least get the best basic rights of education health and many other things is that you know they have not been this is very true that they have not been able to see from other people's lens and the stories that have been told are filled with so much of uh, you know hatred and so much of um, that uh, they cannot see beyond their own stories or they cannot look beyond their own lenses but when people does uh, come out from that uh, you know uh, vision they start feel they 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 very few of them they start seeing things from our own our own lens and they start they also become more mellow or they empathize that time and that's why for us i have used storytelling as one of the most uh, you know um, impactful tool which connects people and also i use my own story of um, uh, struggle of resist resilience resistance for my own story of trauma to transform the kind of work that we are doing in the northeast part of the country that's why our work intersects a lot on health well being drug conflict and migration so many things that we intersect in our work and the one tool that connects everything is storytelling so this has become one of the very most important tool and as you have said i also can i'm also using this tool and really wish to take it forward uh you know to connect more people and to transform the trauma that we have faced and not further transmit it thank you thank you so much mr sadam for your first hand insights uh i would now like to invite dr lina for her perspectives and opinions and ideas thank you thank you mahima <clears throat> thank you dr naila for an amazing amazing pre pre presentation but more importantly for years clearly years of research and thinking that has brought a talk to us of such depth you know when i was invited uh, to to be a discussant i was very keen to accept because uh, i knew i would learn a lot and i was not wrong i mean uh, and the reason i was invited as a dis discussant is presumably because i was involved in writing the new national education policy that india has got as of 2020 i was involved in writing its precursor the draft national education policy 2019 and at that time uh, we did dis discuss many sources of disadvantage but not um, conflict related trauma so much and in fact the only thing that we said about trauma in the policy is that uh, it will have to be dealt with locally and that states should um, look into finding ways to help youth um, 
you know, overcome trauma by investing in teachers, um, uh, you know, uh, and train, by investing in training teachers and so on. That was it really. But you know, what you have brought to us is uh, an amazing range of uh, things that can be done, the message of resilience, the conflict transformation, contact work with Professor Green, the thinking about logical methods of argument, uh, trauma and, uh, informed approach to justice and I mean the last one really blew me learn about trauma at a cerebral level I think that it's it's just so many important messages I'm really looking forward to reading your book I haven't done that so I'll just not take too much time I'll just pose two questions to you which I hope you will address in your um uh, in your responses, uh, which is that, you know, one statement in your introduction and the abstract of your introduction caught my attention. And you said that there is a line between trauma in a non-militarized environment and in a, in a heavily mourning in a heavily militarized environment. You know, the, my um, thinking about, I, I always wondered that, you know, the caste discrimination that has been going on in India, Sada mentioned race, um, has for, you know, it's so intergenerational. It's been going on for hundreds of years and surely those kids also suffer from a lot of trauma. What is the difference and, uh, or, or uh, similarities? Can we address them the same way? And the second question is that I'd like you to reflect a little bit on whether teachers in Kashmir can actually draw from your book and bring some semblance of, of uh, coping to the youth in their classrooms. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lina, Saddam. Would you like me to respond to those questions now or would you yes, like- Yes, please. Yes, okay. So, um, you know, Dr. Saddam, by the way, I loved what you said about the situation of young people in the Northeast, because it was so authentic. It came from the heart. And you live that reality on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly like young people in the Northeast, young people in Jammu and Kashmir face the same precariousness. You know, I often talk about how politics uh, has become very ad hoc in Jammu and Kashmir because you don't know what the next day will bring. Mm -hmm. So even our leaders practice the politics of ad hocism. It's very short term. There are no long term policies in place. Mm -hmm. And also the point that you made, Salam, about the dehumanization of young people in the Northeast. Young people in Jammu and Kashmir face that dehumanization as well. You see, it's either racial discrimination or it's ethnic mm -hmm. or religious. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are caught between the forces of militancy and militarization, mm -hmm. making it difficult for them to carve their own paths. Mm -hmm. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And if young people are simply picked up on suspicion without any evidence at all, you know, that makes them very vulnerable. And how do we deal with that kind of vulnerability? How do we transform trauma in such situations and make sure younger, younger generations? I think the onus lies on the shoulders of young, educated, and intelligent people like you. And, uh, you know, Professor uh, Dr. Lina, while working on my book, I gave um, several talks in Jammu and Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And I gave talks at rural academic institutions as well as urban institutions. Mm -hmm. And I would like to give an example from my book. Let's hope I'm able to find it now. Uh, but I will address both questions, absolutely. Uh, let me see, okay.
All right, so I will read out just one example. So I am in Kashmir every year. Um, and I, over the past, I think, four years, I have seen more of the Kashmir Valley than I had in my adolescence and my childhood and adolescence while I was growing up there. Mm -hmm. So I've seen some beautiful parts of the valley and I would like to give you an example of a session um, in South Kashmir, I believe it was. Give me a moment. All right. Now, I was educated at a missionary school in Surinagar with Irish Catholic nuns as my educators. And I had grown up speaking and writing the English language with ease. My education had given me the tools to express myself with clarity and confidence in an international language. But not every student in South Asia, particularly Jammu and Kashmir, has that privilege. So I had an energizing session with the students of Abdul Ahad Azad Memorial Degree College in mm -hmm. Bemina, which is on the outskirts of the capital city of Jammu and Kashmir, Surinagar. And during that session, a student requested permission to ask his question in Kashmiri. Mm -hmm. And I was sensitive to the student's fear of being unable to adequately express himself in English, which at the end of the day wasn't his native language. The student asked a perceptive question on the politics of translation in the classroom. And he asked if it was legitimate to request a professor to translate an English passage into Kashmiri, particularly for those students whose socioeconomic backgrounds did not give them opportunities to gain familiarity with the English language. My response was, that the purpose of education was to broaden students' horizons by pedagogical innovation. And individuals become empowered to decipher their multifaceted worlds through the vehicle of education. And I strongly believe that young people cannot become productive members of their families, communities, and societies unless they are given the environment to heal and become resilient. Mm -hmm. In the same session, I noticed a faculty member snigger when a highly self-conscious student attempted to ask a question in Americanized English. And it was perhaps the insecurity of sounding undereducated that, that led the student to ask the question with a tang. I mean, not a tang, it's wang, an American twang. Regardless, I appreciated the courage of the student to come out of his shell and overcome his shyness. But I was struck by the contradiction that although there was a critical mass of Kashmiri students in the lecture hall, as well as Kashmiri faculty members, their voices were not encouraged. Mm -hmm. That incident reinforced my recognition that it was imperative for educators to become more engaged mm -hmm. and advocate for their students. And my perceptions became even more grounded after I talked with my colleague and friend Professor Betty Harris about her experiences in Southern Africa. Betty Harris conducted field research in Lesotho, Swaziland, and South Africa. During her Lesotho field research, she became conscientized about refugees 
and others involved in the anti-apartheid movement during many extensive discussions. And that broadened her perspective beyond a US civil rights prism. At the time, many thought that apartheid would come to an end through violent revolution instead of a negotiated settlement. Today, there are born frees, those born after the end of apartheid in 1994, who think that the negotiated settlement did not go far enough in addressing issues of racial, political, and gender inequality. And they entertain the idea of, revol of revolution anew. Mm -hmm. Professor Harris believes that in order for younger generations, and this applies to Kashmir, this applies to the Northeast, that in order for younger generations to channelize their anger, sense of alienation, and take the political process forward without playing into anyone's hands, mm -hmm. education has to become more relevant the youthful experiences. Mm -hmm. it, the educational process is essential in shaping youth intellectual maturity and autonomy, and one's ability to form new organizational structures. Education, however, is a slow process in which there may have to be interruptions requiring more immediate action. Such interruptions must be incorporated into the entire learning process in which we may have to learn from our mistakes as well. That is praxis. You see, every interaction, every conversation with students across the Kashmir Valley led me to think about the disadvantages that Kashmiri students, particularly those in rural areas face. Some of those disadvantages are limited proficiency in the English language, gnawing feelings of alienation from mainstream society, uncertainty looming large, terrible feelings premonitions generated by living in a dysfunctional society. Several of the students I met with belong to marginalized communities who have been demonized by mainstream discourse. Mm -hmm. They have been demonized as either criminals or incorrigibly backward or radicalized, that they are irredeemably radicalized. How can such young people be reintegrated into mainstream society so they can contribute to the regeneration of the nation to which they belong? If members of our younger generations had reason to believe that when they articulated their concerns on issues important to them, particularly issues of social justice, policymakers with the power to change things for the better would listen to them with dignity and respect. And it is then that young people like Saddam, like other young people in the Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir would be able to channel their anger and sense of alienation by concentrating on those issues of political and socio-cultural import. They would not take recourse in merely protesting by lashing out at society in a general sense. Mm -hmm. Many young people give our young people short shrift by not taking them seriously, even when they raise extremely important societal issues. 
either because politicians do not consider young people knowledgeable and credible enough to have viable solutions to such societal problems, or because politicians are too involved in partisan politics. So that needs to be considered. And educators must be trained to deal with trauma. Educators must be trained to acknowledge the stories of our young people, not to dismiss them. That is a problem I have encountered at a few academic institutions in Jammu and Kashmir. I'll give you another example real quick. This was a talk that I gave in Baramullah, which is in North Kashmir. And a young girl asked me, she was very proud that, uh, she, she, she asked me if it was enough to have an article published in a local newspaper. And she said, if one of my articles gets published in a local newspaper, I will feel on top of the world. Mm -hmm. And I will feel like there is nothing more I can learn in class. And one of the professors, instead of addressing the issue with maturity, actually demeaned her. He insulted her in my presence, the presence of a guest speaker and stranger, and said that learn to write one word correctly and then talk. That approach to humiliate a student will not go anywhere. Mm -hmm. yes. You see, Thank you. respectful yeah. discourse within the classroom must be emphasized. And living, there are policy makers in mainland India who live in denial mm -hmm. of the trauma faced by people, particularly young people, in conflict zones like Jammu and Kashmir and the Northeast. Mm -hmm. There is no denying that these young people are traumatized. Yeah. And that trauma must be healed. Yes. You see, development, to talk about development is all very well. To talk about new educational policies is all very well. But to me, all those are buzzwords. Absolutely. It's just a different form of sloganeering. Absolutely. Unless we adopt a trauma-informed approach in the classroom. Thank you. Your point is very well taken. We'll look it up. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Yeah. I apologize to Patrick for taking away his <laughs> discussion time. Patrick, go ahead. Uh, the only thing I'm going to say two things um, uh, after this brief preface. Uh, Dr. Nilo's work reminds me not only of one of her heroes, uh, Victor Frankel, who's also a hero of mine in taking trauma and uh, reality, real life, if you will, the real world, and applying at a much higher level for that cerebral side that was referred to earlier, depth and understanding. And my reflection is that at times her works, uh, uh, especially the personal aspects uh, brought to bear in an academic context remind me of one of the great historians of the last century, but also a great novelist, and that was Alexander Solzhenitsyn, mm -hmm. who wrote about the horror of the gulag. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the world today, there are many gulags you know, for the Uyghurs in Western China, mm -hmm. for other people scattered around the world. There are levels of trauma, but I find very appealing her, her work at blending the personal like the story about her students uh, just now, the story about a couple of her students, students yes. with that higher level. Solzhenitsyn wrote in Cancer Ward that the meaning of existence is to preserve untarnished, undisturbed, and undistorted the image of eternity with which each person is born, mm -hmm. like a silver moon in a calm, still, pond. 
Now I can deal with the academic issues and I do often, but that is a quotation that goes to the heart of his life's work. He was not perfect. One of the things we need to find the ability to do is forgive one another, especially for sins that are not our own, mm -hmm. but that come from the past. The last thought is several weeks ago, I uh, delivered a speech and I'm just gonna give you one sentence from it about a uh, leader here in Oklahoma. Um, and it's something I wrote after the bombing in Oklahoma City in 1995, after several weeks of watching the way people did come together in a horrific circumstance. And it was this, the trouble with love in one heart or many is that it requires vulnerability. For a long time, I was afraid maybe that wasn't original. And I've spent the last 20 something years searching. And I think it was, I think that's mine. Uh, it owes a lot to C.S. Lewis, for example, and to Solzhenitsyn. Mm -hmm. I offer those sort of uplifting comments here at the end because we need a lot of uplifting in this world right now. Right. And I believe that Dr. Nyla is doing a lot to contribute to that. That vulnerability that I just referenced needs to be brought to bear in academia as well. And it needs to be brought to bear uh, with respect to those who went before us, you know, those of the past who created a framework for our discussion, but who were highly imperfect human beings like each and every one of us who collectively did things that we now can look at and reach pretty harsh conclusions about. Now that's where I'll stop uh, because I want to assist uh, Dr. Kumar and the staff at uh, getting back on schedule here. So thank you for involving me. I have more that I could offer and I will in another setting, I hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rina, for your questions and Professor Naila for responding to them and then following that, uh, Mr. Patrick, for your perspectives and insights. Um, uh, I would now request any questions that may come from the discussants or from the audience. I just want to know what's next for Dr. Nyla Khan. What's the next book? I, I, on a personal level, I've shared with her the thought that, you know, maybe it's time to go even deeper on the personal side, keeping it tethered to uh, these important conversations that reach the level of academia. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's sometimes a, uh, and I think you referenced it very nicely in your description of that uh, professor. Uh, yeah. We've perhaps each of us in different ways have at times uh, shown a similar frustration or a harshness towards a student. Mm -hmm. That's something we can learn from. Uh, but my experience has been uh, in Oklahoma City, I uh, uh, actually attended a school one week long uh, for the group called the Education and Employment Ministry. Now the group now specializes in incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. And at that time it was broader than that. And when I tell people I attended the team school, they go, well, what did you go to prison for? Well, I've never been in prison, but I did learn something in my time connected to team and in that one week. And that was, I had a lot in common I had a lot of burdens in common at a different depth level, perhaps, than particularly those men who had been inside mm -hmm. uh, prison facilities. And that lesson has stuck with me. I learned that uh, more than two decades ago, and it's helped to guide my life ever since. Briefly, that's sort of the preface to my question since I was given the opportunity to continue. Uh, what's next for Dr. Nyla Ali Khan? That's a great question. <laughs> you and I will talk about that. We'll talk very soon. There are a couple of uh, Mahima Arjun, if it's okay with you guys, just a couple of concluding remarks that I would like to make. And then, is that okay, Mahima Arjun? 
Yes, Can yes. I make a couple yes. of concluding remarks and then. Okay, so I just um so I continue to reinforce my faith as an educator in the openness to diverse opinions, to dissent, and to differences of opinion, which is true grit. And when I spoke with various activists, scholars, and clinicians while working on my book, I saw that they all built common ground by sharing the fundamental principles of humanity, compassion, and empathy. Mm -hmm. And Saddam talked about the lack of empathy that young people from the Northeast face. So the academics and clinicians I spoke with underlined empathy, which blurs the divide between us and them. Mm -hmm. And we all know this, but I feel the need to say it anyway. India was never a monolithic nation. Mm -hmm. India was a pluralistic, diverse nation where I as a child and an adolescent celebrated heterogeneity, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And we require a restoration of that pluralism. Mm -hmm. We require a celebration of that heterogeneity in our education system in India today. Mm -hmm. We need to give, provide and create safe spaces for our students to question any monolithic entities, to question respectfully, any attempt to homogenize the nation, to homogenize the Indian identity. That is Absolutely. a very important part. Absolutely. You know, and, and the value of empathy would enable us to humanize those racial groups, those ethnic groups, those religious groups in India <laughs> that for a long time, that historically have been marginalized. Mm -hmm. right. I wonder if you could take 30 seconds to answer my previous question, which was that, is there a difference between caste type of the trauma from caste discrimination and discrimination from uh, military uh, situations? You mentioned that there is a difference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my book, I talked about mourning at a personal level and the mourning of a community that has been uh, traumatized because of militarization. Mm -hmm. But your question about trauma because of caste discrimination and trauma because of militarization, caste discrimination, as we well know, has existed historically mm -hmm. in India, right? Caste discrimination in India is as old as the mountains. Mm -hmm. And those divides, unfortunately, are deeply entrenched even today in the 21st century, mm -hmm. despite uh, the empowerment that the constitution of the country, despite the empowerment that civilized caste. Right. And, um, you know, that's, I don't know, I would have to know that people in militarized zone space, for instance, in India, it would be Jammu and Kashmir, it would be the Northeast. There is a lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. There is a lack of transparency. Young people, the reason everything is so ad hoc for them because they feel like the status quo will never change. They don't recognize the power of the vote. They don't recognize the power of their own voices and the importance of standing up and being counted because there is such a lack of accountability 
in militarized zones, mm -hmm. in conflict zones. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, there are times, you know, I go back to Kashmir every year, that there are times when I sense that the people of the place are so, um, the people of the place feel like they require permission to enjoy their own resources, <laughs> you know? And that needs to be, um, that needs to be worked on. The, the, the government, real development, real progress does not come with the imposition of projects. But it comes with making sure that people, that local communities are invested in whatever is going on. And when the local community, particularly young people in that community, are made to feel like stakeholders and are brought to the table in order to express themselves, their needs, their situations, and are taken seriously by policy makers and decision makers, even those involved in making changes in the educational curriculum. You see, that is when we will see more healing. Right? Thank you so much. Yeah. And even if you, yeah, even if you think about caste discrimination in India, you know, in this day and age, we have so, quite so many people from historically lower castes who are involved in elite organizations. So the civil services of India, for instance, we have a lot of IAS officers, we have a lot of IPS officers, we have IFS officers as well, who come from those historically marginalized communities. But despite that, those lines of caste, um, those fault lines of caste remain in India. Can I add one? So I, I don't here? think we should be thinking about. Yeah, go ahead, Salam. Go ahead. No, I was I was just thinking uh, what Lina Ma'am was asked was asking about the difference between caste related uh, conflict, uh, sorry, caste related trauma and um, military related trauma. I don't know. Um, it may not be right. My answer may not be right. But what I feel to myself when I go through it is like. You know, um, when we talk about caste-related trauma, it's, it's more in the horizontal line of, you know, inferiority and superiority of who's superior and who's inferior in the caste system and how caste has been perpetrated. But when I see trauma, I see it in a more like a vertical, you know, a unit from the upside up, from up to down, like from the state sponsored, which is like about, it talks about inclusion and exclusion of about how caste is more like, a, you know, society sponsored trauma. And how, uh, you know, um, militarization is more like a state-sponsored trauma. Like what we are mostly facing for the, about the incident that happened yesterday, day for yesterday was also through the state-sponsored militaries, not by the society. But when we generally talk about caste-related issues, it's mostly by the people from the deep community or from that region, which are, you know, very much a part of the society. So what we have felt is more like that. It may not be right anywhere, but according to me, what I have seen and felt uh, is that mm. from my side. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. I, I, think, I think that's a good point. But you know, unfortunately, caste divides in India are seeping into our politics as well. So when we talk about state-sponsored violence and societal violence, I don't think the line of demarcation is as clear as we would like it to be, mm -hmm. right? Uh, of course, wh whenever I talk to young people in Kashmir, I always tell them to make sure that they recognize the difference between nation and nation state. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's exactly the point you were making as well, Saban. And that they recognize the difference between civil society and government. And that they recognize the difference between citizens and government. 
So militarization, you're exactly right in the Northeast, and militarization in Jammu and Kashmir cannot be blamed on all the citizens of India or the nation. Nation building is quite different from bolstering a nation state, mm -hmm. right? So I think because we don't want to go down the path of demonizing an entire uh, community, an entire nation. So yeah, yeah, I see your points about that. That made sense to me. Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor Naila, for your concluding remarks and the discussion, the very enriching discussion that followed it. Uh, with that, um, I would like to propose the formal word of thanks. I would like to congratulate Dr. Naila on her book and thank her for thank taking you. out the time thank to discuss it in an enriching manner. I would also like to thank the discussants, Dr. Lena, Mr. Sadam, and Mr. Patrick for their time, perspectives, and ideas, the... and questions. I would like to also thank the audience who are viewing this discussion live on Zoom and on Facebook Live, and who will later be viewing it on our YouTube channel. We look forward to the panel's further work and discussions. Thank you so much for being part of this hashtag web policy talk. I hope you have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Naila, so nice for giving us so you. much to think about. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Naila. Thank you. It was great to meet you. Yes. Thank you. Me too. Nice. I agree. Bye bye. Thanks, Arjun. Thanks. Thank Mahima. you, Arjun. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mahima. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.